Okay, we'll go ahead and start with a word of prayer. Lord God, make heaven and earth, maker of all things that are seen and unseen, to you belongs all praise, glory, and honor. Help us now to look into your word and to understand it. We ask this in your son's name, Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, we left off here, like, seems like a long time ago, two weeks ago. Um, the first temptation. And the first Adam disobeyed, and we were all made slaves. And then the last Adam obeyed, and prison doors were opened. Um, so here's the, the, the thesis we're taking into the study. Philippians 2, 7, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. It says, made himself of no reputation. That word is to make empty, which takes us back to Jabok, the river that empties itself into the River Jordan and into the Dead Sea, that is the same thing. And that's why this makes sense, him having gone to that place. Um, and it says here, and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. So become, and that's anthropos. That's man, and that is what Luke is all about. So Jesus emptied himself and became man, and he's both. He's fully man and he's fully God. But Luke stressed in the fact that he was the perfect man. So that's the thesis. And Jesus answered him saying, it is written that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. So this is, the answer, this is an answer to the first uh, temptation. Now man lives in three worlds, a uh, whole man. He's, he lives in three worlds. He lives in the world of the flesh, he lives in the world of the spirit, and he lives in the world of the mind. Uh, things such as religion, art, and, and things like that, they're things of the mind, the soul. So if Jesus is gonna be tested, he's gotta be tested on, on, at all three levels. He's gotta be tested on all three aspects. Now this little book, I read like when I was 22 or 23 or something, when I was in the military. That, it's an amazing little book, but that had a, had a change in me. Even though I wasn't a Christian yet, when I read that book, Victor Frankl is a psychiatrist, and he was, he was a Jew who was uh, in one of the camps in Germany, and he pointed this out, that without hope, man dies. And that's the thing that, 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 that jumped out at me. He says without, because man could live, he says, he pointed out the dire conditions in a camp People were starving, and walking in the snow without shoes, and some of their feet were frostbitten. And, and so he says, in conditions like that, men could still live, but the minute they gave up hope, the minute they gave up, he says, because he, he was studying him, he was a psychiatrist, even in, in the camp. He was making notes of this, he says that, when they gave up hope with, uh, with the, uh, of the fact that they were, or the idea that they were ever going to be rescued or that they'll never see their loved ones, he says they would die. Soon thereafter, they would die. And then I, I, I connected that with this verse in, found in Psalm 39, 7. And now, Lord, what wait I for? My hope is in thee. And I put the little word manna right next to that verse there. Because manna means what? It's whatness. What is it? That's what they didn't know what that was. When the Jews found the little whore thing that found that fell on the ground every morning, they, that's what they called it. What? 
So I want you to keep that in mind. That's what that is. What wait I for? And I think it's a connection to the Word of God. Now, so he's going to be, Jesus has got to be tempted on all three aspects of man, the flesh. So we saw that he was, last week we saw that he was tested on the, at the level of the flesh. And what that, he was tested on the fact that God, you can't trust God to meet all your needs. That's what the devil was telling him. Make these stones bread. But that's for us. This is pointing this out to us. We, we're going to be tested at every level. And so we're, we're tested at this level as well. That God will not take care of us. And folks, looking back at my life, He always has. He's always provided for me. I mean, we all have food. We all have clothing. We all have shelter. We all have ways to get around. They might not all be the same, but nonetheless, God is meeting our needs. And he's, He does that. He provides jobs. He does, all, he does that. And yet, we worry and we scurry around thinking, how am I going to do this? When the whole time God says, look at the birds. Look at the flowers. So, look at this. In Hebrews 4.15 4, says, For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. So he had to be tested on all these levels. And he was. And the Bible says, and without sin, he didn't sin. So in order to be an intercessor for us, he had to understand. He had to have sympathy. He had to have an understanding of what we go through. And this tells us so much how God sees us. He knows what we're going through. This is what this tells us. And no matter what, you have, what you're going through, God says, this tells us he was tempted on our level. And he knows, you know. Um, and we do that to ourselves as well. The people that go through certain tests, certain things, can counsel others on that. Because they know what it feels like. Um, and so God, we have a high priest, an intercessor. If he's going to intercede for us, he knows what it's like to be human. He was here 2,000 years ago. Jesus answered, that's to conclude for oneself, to arrive at a judgment or opinion by reasoning. Now, remember last week we talked about how Jesus went into, the, into that area to be tested into the wilderness. So he would teach us how. He's going to teach us how to deal with temptation. So, and he humbled thee and suffered thee to hunger and fed thee with manna which thou knewest not, neither thy fathers, neither did thy fathers know. Now he's going to quote from this, from Deuteronomy 8. And this is part of the first portion from where he quotes. And look what it says here. He humbled thee and suffered thee to hunger and fed thee with manna. That's the whatness. That means, what is it? I don't know. And you got to keep in mind, we forget that the Jews at this point did not have the Bible. Maybe they had the book of Job. Maybe they had Genesis. But that's about it. At this point, they didn't have the Bible. So if you're going to hope in something, well, what are you hoping? What are you... Because we have the Word of God, and we have, it's such a great hope. When I read portions like this, it blows me away. I have the Bible to read to give me hope. God knows what He's doing. He knows what He's doing. It's going to be all right, no matter what. But they didn't know, which thou knewest not, neither did thy fathers know. They didn't know it. And that's the manna, when they picked it up every morning. And they, folks, Folks, they survived on it for 38 years. That's how long they ate, or, or longer, you I mean uh, 40, because they were given that as they crossed. We're gonna see that. 
that he might make me to know that man doth not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord doth man live. And I circled live. You will live if you have hope. Just like I pointed out that Victor Frankl says, the minute you give up hope, you die or things go south on you. So here you have, this is how the Lord is pointing it out to us. But if you don't know the Bible, if you, can't, if you don't read the Bible, you, know, you don't know what he says in there to have hope. So the Lord is teaching us because he quoted from the, what they had, the Old Testament. Because at the, at the time of the Lord, the New Testament did not exist. And the devil taking him up on a high mountain showed him, showed unto him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said unto him, All this power will I give thee, and the glory of them, for that is delivered unto me, and to whomsoever I will give it. So then he takes him, this is the second temptation. He says, all this will I, all the, all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. I don't know how that was done, literally, or whether in the spirit, but this happened. All this power will I give, will I give thee and the glory of them. If thou wilt therefore worship me, all will, be, all will be thine. And I can't help but think, folks, that I think this still goes on. I think people sell themselves out. Or, because I look at people in the world that have everything they touch seems to go well. Uh, I think of Meg Jagger of the Rolling Stones. I mean, these guys, I mean, the guy's old and he's still rock and rolling. I'm thinking, good night. Everything he touches turns to gold. And same thing with Oprah. Uh, uh, she, she came out of a movie of a color purple or whatever. And all of a sudden, she just makes money, making money left and right. Everything she touches as well. But her, but their theology is so messed up. Oprah, especially when she says, there's many ways to God. No, there ain't. There's only one. Um, so they tend to worship uh, the, and serve. Because whomever you worship, that's who you will serve. Jesus answered and said unto him, Get thee behind me, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Whoever you worship, that's who you will serve. And that applies to us. Anything you set out to, to worship, whatever you make your main thing, that's what you'll serve. Whether, whether it be a career or, or a, a person or whatever. And, he's, and it shall be, if thou do at all forget the Lord thy God, and walk after other gods, and serve them, and worship them, I testify against you this day that thou shalt surely perish. This is not the ideal quote. He quoted from Deuteronomy from another place, but I'm giving you this because it's got worship and, and, and serve it in the same verse. So Jesus is going back from the Bible and he's showing us how to defend yourself against the flesh or against temptation every single time he's going back there to the Old Testament Deuteronomy and quoting from there serve them and worship them whoever you serve that's what you're going to worship you'll be enslaved a bondman you shall surely perish And then he brought him to, a, to Jerusalem and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down from hence, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee, and in their hands thou shalt bear thee, they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. Notice what's going here. This is now the third temptation. This is the pinnacle of the temple. And I look at that word, pinnacle. It means the most successful point. The uppermost high place. And, and look at of the temple. 
Now the temple has three parts, right? It's got the court, it's got the holy place, and it's got the holy of holies. It's got the three parts. You would think that the most, the highest place of the temple or our being is the spiritual aspect or the holy of holies. That's what you would normally think. You would naturally think that. But you know that it is not. That's not the highest place of the temple. The highest place of the temple is the soul. Because God says that's the place where decisions are made. Because the flesh or the court, the soul decides whether to give over to the court, to the flesh, or the, or the soul decides to give over to the spiritual aspect. God never in the Bible overrides man's decisions. I mean, man, that's why the book of Esther is so precious. Because in the book of Esther, the king is calling the shots. The, it's all about the king. In the book of Esther, at the beginning, the ring is being worn by Haman, right? He's got the ring. And at the end of the story of the book of Esther, more, uh, Ahasuerus takes it away from Haman and gives the ring to Mordecai. Who does the ring shifting? It is the king. So the soul is king. And this is why I'm thinking when we get to the books of Kings, the book of Kings and Chronicles, good night, I can hardly wait. Because he's gonna, he's gonna teach us a lot of things about ourselves. The king, the king, we are the king. Because I used to think, I used to think years ago, I used to think, Lord, this doesn't really apply to me. I'm a peasant, I'm a pawn, I'm nobody special. Because book, the book of Psalms is written primarily, it's, it's royalty literature, it's about the king, it's all to the king. I says, this really doesn't apply to me. And the Lord had to take me by the ear and says, look at here. You will be responsible because you are ruling. You are the king. You rule over our domain. Oh, good. This applies to men and women. All are kings. Or if you want to be a queen, I mean, you can be that as well. But you're in, you're in charge over that domain. So look at that. Here's where the quote is. The quote is, if thou be the son of God, cast thyself down from thence. For it is written, he shall give his angels charge over thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against the stone. Look what he says here. There is something that is left out. This is why the devil, he knows the Bible better than we do. So when he quotes it, you can be misguided because if he doesn't quote it correctly like it's there, it'll get you into trouble just like Eve got into trouble. So right there where it says to keep thee, and then it's got colon. Something's left out. I'm gonna show you what's left out. And it says, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against the stone. It says, you can, you, can, you can cast yourself down from here, from where? From that position, that high position, you can cast yourself down. You're in charge, but you can cast yourself down. That's, that's the way I'm reading it. Now watch this. This is amazing, folks. For he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee, and this is what he left out, in all thy ways. They shall bear thee up, in their hands, thou dash, lest thou dash thy foot against the stone. So we left this out in all thy ways. And I kept going over that. I said, what does that mean? Because everything in the Bible means something. So he says, this is the way I look at it, folks. Cast yourself down. You can take yourself and cast yourself down from there, from that position. So it means you're going along life and at a certain point in time you say, well, you know, I've been such a good guy. I tithe, I go to Sunday school, I do all the right things. 
It's okay to go walk in the wild side for a little while. That's what the devil says. You know, you've been a good boy all the time. I mean, you can do this. It's okay. God forgives. So you bring yourself down and the devil says, you'll be caught up. The angels, the angels will bring you back up. They'll lift you up. He says, don't do that. And then you can go on your way. See, it's, it's all taken care of. Because we assume, look at this folks. If you cast yourself down, you're assuming you are keeping yourself up. That's what that means. And I'm gonna show you how, why, that, why I believe that. Look at this. Way in the Old Testament, when they crossed the Red Sea, they crossed at the Gulf of Aqaba into Saudi Arabia. Look what happens here. They crossed over and they're going to Mount Sinai or Mount Horeb and they come to a place called Masa Meribah. Okay, now look, this is what it says here. Look at this, Exodus 17:7, 7. and he called the name, <clears throat> the name of the place Masa Meribah, because of the chiding of the children of Israel, because they tempted the Lord, saying, "This is the tempted, this is the temptation that they, they tempted the Lord, which the Lord says, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God." But they did that in the Old Testament, saying, "What did they say? This is what they said." Is the Lord among us or not? Is he here or not? He has just provided, he sweetened the waters. He gave them an oasis of uh, 12 wells with the, uh, 70 trees, remember that? He just done that and he's given them manna. He's taking care of them. And then they have the gall to say, is the Lord with us or not? He's telling Moses that and Moses says, Lord, what do I do? because they're, the people are thirsty and they're telling Moses, and they're, Moses says, they're ready to stone me. And I says, good night, how can they say that? But we do that. We tempt the Lord saying, if I'm a Christian, if I'm your son or your daughter, how come this is happening to me? Now look what, look what goes on here. That is verse seven, okay? Look what happens on the next verse. Then came Amalek and fought with Israel in Rephidim. Okay, who is Amalek? Well, I'm glad you asked. Amalek, okay, you have twin brothers. You have Esau and Jacob. They're twin brothers, just like we are. Every single one of us is a twin. The day you were born, your flesh was born. You're a duality or you got the other side. That's the side that's really bad, the flesh side. Now, in the flesh, in the, in the case of Esau, Esau had a son called Eliphaz. And by the way, that, that's the, that character turns up in Job as well. And Eliphaz had Amalek. That means that Amalek is the flesh. So now you know who Amalek is. Okay, then came Amalek and fought with Israel in Rephidim. So the next word we need to find out is, what does that mean is Rephidim, okay? So you look at Rephidim, Rephidim means balusters. I said, what? That can't be right. A lot of things in the Bible, when you go looking at them, like when, when we talked about Mary, Mary means rebellious. I says, all these people that have named their daughters Mary, did they know that? You know, because that's what that means. Wow. You know, look at this. It means baluster. It means it's a little pillar. And we have them right there on the steps going up. Those pillars are to, they keep up the rail. That's what they keep, they're keeping up the rail and the rail protects you from falling, okay? Over on either side. So when I was first looking at that, I said, well, what is that? That does make no sense. It doesn't make sense until you find out what happened at Rephidim. Moses, they had, Amalek came and fought 
They had not had a, they had not had to fight with anybody up to this point. God was opening the Red Sea. God conquered the the, the, the Egyptians, but they were moving along. And now Amalek is attacking them out of nowhere. Comes Amalek, and they fought with Israel. And so what the Lord is telling us, I believe, that you're going through life and you think you're be holding yourself up. You think you're doing pretty good. I come to church because I have a good will. I want to serve the Lord. I want to teach. So I'm going through life. Look at me. Look what I'm doing. God says, don't do that. Because if you do that, thinking that you're keeping yourself up, the Lord says, I'm going to show you what will happen. The flesh. He says, because this, upholding the law, Remember Moses, Moses went up on the hill and he says his tires got tired and so he had two men come on either side to help him. One was uh, Aaron and the other one was Hur. These are the two people that went up to help him to, because when the arms were up, Israel won. But when the arms were down, Amalek one. So he's telling us, you're being held up by two, by two entities. We are the rail or our life. But the fact that we're being kept up all these years, it belongs to God. It's by the mercies of the Lord. We are kept up. It's not our doing. Good night when you see this. It's amazing, Lord. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you for keeping us. It's amazing that we are held up, that we're going on. And it's amazing that we'll end our life, hopefully on a good note, because many people fall down. And I think it's because they don't know this. Because look what it says here. Then came Amalek, when they were thinking, is, he, is God with us or not? Uh, probably not. Look, we're dying of thirst there. But God was teaching. He was teaching, teaching them something. And so he was. And we look back at this. I mean, everything that happened to them, the Bible says it happened as examples for us. Now look at this. Jesus answered and said unto him, It is said, it is said, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Why is that? To tempt the Lord is to test him because he, he might just allow this. You are being held up. And he shows us, look at this, by two people, Aaron and Moses. Who's Aaron? Aaron, the spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. So the spirit of God is praying for us. That's what the Bible tells us. He's praying. He's at the right hand. The Spirit is praying for us. And then another person is praying for us. Romans 8, 34. Who is even at the right hand of God. Who also maketh intercession for us. Can you imagine having these two powerful entities of the Godhead. Praying for you. No wonder we're held up. No one. I'm thinking good night. If the Lord was to take those balusters from my life. What would happen to me? I'd probably become a drunkard. I'd probably walk the streets like a dodo bird. It is of the Lord's hand. This, because this is what he says. Look what he says here. This I call to mind, therefore have I hope. It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. That's when the manna came, every morning. So this tells us, folks, that the Word of God is so important. It is, no matter, I tell people, even if, even if you don't understand it, read it. Because it's, going, it's percolating through you, and it's going to do you good. It gives you hope. But this is what the Lord is teaching us. Look at this one. Psalm 3, 5, I laid me down, I slept, I awake, for the Lord sustained me. And that word sustain, to prop, 
a pole or a beam used as support or to keep something in position. That's what that means. So we are being kept up. This is why the Lord says, don't test that. Don't think that you, the test would be to say, you know, I've been a pretty good guy. For all this time, I've been doing this. I have been doing this because I, I figured it was good, so I just did it. God says, oh, really, have you? And then he can, all, he does, all he's got to do is knock the props out from under me. And what would happen to me? That's what that means. Now, you shall not tempt the Lord your God as you tempted him in Masa. In Masa. And that's what that means. That's why we have to go back and look at that. It's, and he says, uh, in the wilderness, in the desert. And then he said this, and he called the name of the place Masa and Meribah, the provocation, because of the chiding of the children of Israel and because they tempted the, the Lord saying, is the Lord among us or not? And that's what he's saying, the Lord Jesus. He's used that. And when the devil had ended all the temptation, he departed from him for a season. So he's done with the temptation for a season. So this tells you, like many preachers have pointed this out, that he never really totally gives up on you. He'll leave you for a while. That's what that says, for a season. Chances are he's gonna come back at it again. You're gonna be tempted again. It's never over till the day you die. No matter what, no matter. I used to think that at a certain point in life, you're gonna arrive. You know, you're gonna start getting smart and you're not gonna make, Chances are you're going to sin less, but you're never saved, folks. You never, until the day you die. The day I die, I says, man, I made it. But that'll be, that's the only time you can say that. Then the devil leaveth him, and behold, angels came and ministered unto him. And, I put, and I, that verse was given to me by Brother Ashton, that when we talked about, remember? Mahanaim, and then came the other camp that was there. This is the other camp. The angels ministered unto him. So he was starving for 40, year, 40 days, and then afterwards, I wonder what kind of food did they bring? They, they brought food. They ministered unto him. Did they bring barbacoa tacos? Or menudo? I don't know. I don't know, but it could be homemade tortillas, corn tortillas, mm. or was it a hamburger? I don't know. But they ministered unto him. They came. Now look at this. He had to be tested on, on all these levels, the man test. The Son of Man had to be tested as man is. Man should wait on God's provision. Man should wait on God's power. And man should wait on God's process. But we don't. How many times have I done things without waiting on God? I just do the thing and I says, oh, I wonder if I should have done that. Or we'll say, I prayed about it. But then we didn't wait, we just did it anyway. But Jesus came and we says that he did wait. Jesus, as the son of man, he, did, he, didn't, he waited on God's provision. He didn't make the stones. He didn't turn the stones into bread. He waited on God's power and he waited on God's process, which is the cross. The devil says, you can get all the kingdoms, all the ruling, all that without the cross. He says, no. He. So Jesus, the Bible says he was approved. Jesus was approved. He's been accepted. And because he's approved, we are accepted. Look at this. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. So here we have, I mean, the, this is a oh, powerful verse, because this tells us that Jesus knows what it's like to be a man. He does. To be hungering in the desert, that, I mean, the body he had was real. He had a real body. And 40 days, folks, is a long time. He must have been starving. The body must have been screaming at him. You're gonna die. He goes through it. So when he looks down at our lives, he considers the feebleness of mind or body. He knows what we're going through. 
You can never go to heaven and say, Lord, you never knew what it was like to be down there. It says, yes, I did. And, uh, and also, the fact that he had a perfect body. Now look at this. And Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit into Galilee, and there went, there went out a fame of him throughout all the region round about, and he taught in their synagogues, being glorified of all. He got everything the devil was suffering him. He got it all right here. He tells us he got it all. He returned back. Now look what happens here. He turned back from Rabok, for he was being tested. He, he made it. He goes back to the River Jordan. But this is interesting, folks. I says, why didn't he cross the river there? He doesn't. Look where he goes. The Bible tells us in John that he was at John the Baptist was baptizing in a place called Beth Abara. That means the fairy house. That's where they cross you over, right? That's where they, you cross back. Now look what goes on here. John the Baptist says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. That's, what, that's the sacrifice. He's going to die. Remember? So he had to be pointed out because he's going to cross the Jordan. And when you cross the Jordan, remember we talked about that? That's death to self. But in Jesus' case, he was really going to die. Not like us. It's a picture. So he crosses over and immediately two people look at him and, this, and he, Jesus turns back and says, what do you seek? And who were those people? Andrew and John. And they answer, Rabbi, where dwellest thou? And he says, come and see. So he, they stayed with him that night. And then they followed him, followed him all the way to, to Galilee. That was Andrew and John, the first two disciples. And then Andrew calls his brother, that was Peter. And then John calls his brother James. So now you have four disciples. And then Jesus finds Philip. And Philip calls Nathaniel. So he's got six. He's got six now. Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit. There's the power of the Spirit, not his own power. And there went out a fame. He didn't have to seek it. It just naturally, throughout the Galilee area, immediately there was, there was a fame about him. And, and, and then as he taught in their synagogues, being glorified of all. So everything that the devil was uh, offering, he got naturally. And he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went out into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. Let's just cover this a little bit. So he comes across from Capernaum, he goes to Nazareth, and um, uh, Luke doesn't mention this, but I thought I'd mention this, because this is, he went through a little town called Cana, because he had been invited there. Both Jesus was called and his disciples to the marriage. Now, we're gonna get into this when we get to John, so we're gonna have to wait for that. But folks, I think because he had six disciples, I think he's talking about the six water pots. He's gonna convert to wine. And that is a fantastic lesson when we cover it. Because joy is coming. Now, and look what he says. The, this beginning of miracles did Jesus in Cain of Galilee and manifested both his glory and his disciples believed on him. And this is why I, I mentioned that, because his disciples believed on him. Where he had been brought up. This is where Jesus as a man is going to start his ministry. Where he was brought up. And I think he's telling us that you, wherever the Lord saves you, that's where he wants you to start the ministry. That's where you, that's where you are to serve. You know? And then, look what he says here. He says, they that see, he didn't go to they that see, he went to those that were blind. Because they that see, you can't really talk to a person like that person out, out there. He thinks he sees. So I'm not going to waste my time with him. Because he thinks he sees. I, I'd rather talk to somebody that doesn't know. You know? 
Uh, and this is what the Lord is doing here. He went to those that are, as, as, as his custom was, he was known for this. Now, we're going to close here. Okay. And the, and the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and the recovering of the sight of the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. This is, this is the beginning. This is the start of the ministry. Look what, look what he's saying here, folks. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, and that's me. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, and that's us. Because we, this is what he says, what will happen to the church, the Spirit-filled church, who we are. We're to give the gospel for this reason, to preach the gospel, to preach deliverance to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind. That's teaching. And to set liberty them that are bruised, counseling and prayer. To preach the acceptable year of the Lord. Salvation. Today is a day of salvation. And that's what the church, because the body, See, if you notice, I put a body up there, but it's got no head. The church is his body. Jesus was here in person, and then he left, and then we are supposed to be doing the same work that Jesus was doing, which is what he went to do at Galilee, at Nazareth. And that's us. We are the body. And the body is still supposed to be doing the gospel, the teaching, the counseling and prayer, and given salvation today. Today is an acceptable year because he's coming back. This is what it tells us. He is coming back. So we'll close here. Let's pray. Lord God, thank you for your kindness and goodness towards us. Thank you for your word, Lord, that is so fantastic. We love you. And in your name, Jesus Christ, we give you the praise, the glory, and the honor for beside you there is another God. Amen. And we have 15 minutes before the service. Good, good.